Welcome everyone to the latest edition of the Verde and Black podcast with me, Adrian Healy. Verde and Black are brought to you by our friends at PointsBet, official founding partner of Austin FC, and also by Swish Dental. 10 family dental locations around the fine city of Austin. Uh, my guest today, and I'm delighted to be able to bring him into uh, the studio here, is uh, Dave Tenney. Dave, for those of you who don't know, is uh, the High Performance Director here at Austin FC. Dave, uh, thanks so much for taking time out of a, a busy period yes, at the moment. Uh, well, thank you for having me on. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure and it's, an honor. It's taken a long time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies that it's taken a long time for this to happen. Um, just, just to kind of get the ball rolling, yep. uh, and, and I know you probably get tired of answering uh, this sort of question, but 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 for the lay person out there, uh, and, and maybe I, I will include myself in that, when you're asked to describe your role in, in the team and your role within the coaching staff, how, how, how do you, and maybe that's a role yeah. that's kind of constantly evolving, but what do you yeah. say when you're asked, asked that question? It's it's a great question. Um, the role of the high performance director, I mean, in in a lot of ways, is um, it's someone that's connecting what I would say, connecting coaching to what we call high performance. Right, and our high performance team is our medical team, fitness, sports science, psychology, yep. nutrition, um, anything related to physical performance. Uh, yeah, I suppose, and mental as well. Um, and then tying that into the coaching staff and really trying to make coaching, medical, fitness, one cohesive, mm. collaborative group that makes you know, really good decisions in how we train and work with our athletes on a daily basis. Mm. I, mean, I guess in a, in a nutshell, it'd be a, a summary. Yeah, that's a great summary. And, 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 and I already feel you keying in on the word collaboration. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, that's a, that, that's a key word. Yeah, for you and what you do in as part of Josh's staff. Yeah, yeah right? I mean, I think w it's funny if you look at. I mean, obviously, I, I started in MLS in 2007, and actually in 2008 in Kansas City, there was two athletic trainers. Curtin Offa was head coach. I mm. was I was one of two assistants. Chris Kelderman was the other assistant, and you had even you know, Josh and Davey were both in that team, and it was basically five total staff members mm. of that whole. You know what today is a high performance department where you've got you know head coach and four assistants and then our high performance team is about eight right so just in that 14 years i mean the size of the of, of that whole group that manages these athletes is tripled in size mm. right so if you're not spending a lot of time you know trying to improve how these groups collaborate communicate interact with each other um that's when when big problems happen mm. for austin fc fans right now wondering what what an average week in the life of Dave Tenney looks like. Is there such a thing? Is, is every week different? Is there, is there, are there patterns to what you do? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we love the Saturday to Saturday weeks. You know, I think that, I mean, not just me liking rhythm, but I mean, players like and, and feel comfort with uh, a certain rhythm mm. doing the same sorts of things on certain days. I think most athletes kind of want to, want to work within that rhythm. And, and for me, that means that you know, you play a game on Saturday, typically Sunday's off. At some point on Sunday, I would, you know, kind of look at all the data from, from the match and, mm. and maybe look at our match and look at the other, you know, kind of running loads of the other matches throughout MLS and mm. um, give a breakdown to the coaches and, and Claudio on, on our running, um, the physical outputs from the game. Yeah. And then really, and then really send a little summary blueprint over to, to you know, Josh and, and Nolan Sheldon and the rest of the coaches are saying, okay, going into this week, this is how I would see the, yeah. what the various training days looks yeah. like, when we're going to train heavier, when we're going to train lighter, what sort of, you know, what's, what general basis of what types of exercises mm. we could potentially do. Um, and then, you know, Josh works with Nolan together to really figure out in the details of, okay, tactically, what do we want to do mm. in each particular day, depending on, you know, kind of the physical parameters, you know, we, we determine what day we're going to go really light. Because right? yeah. you can't, you know, it's, you go heavy maybe twice a week yeah. in training sessions. You, you figure out how to lighten up and then, um, and then really just connecting with, you know, Chad Clark is, Klarsic is our performance coach and really when to, you know, do work in the weight room and, mm. you know, things like that. So again, trying yeah. to just tie all the different pieces together and, 
you know, Aki Tajima is our director of sports medicine and figuring out when we're going to do treatments and recovery and massage therapy yeah. and they, all those pieces are important as yeah. well over the course of the year. So. Yeah. And again, really for the layperson and the Austin FC fans who, who don't have the benefit of being here every day, maybe maybe just dig into a little bit into what a, what a heavy day might look like. I mean, I think fans often assume, oh, just players always come to training at a certain yeah. time, they finish at a certain time, they're doing the same thing every day. It's very different. And I, even with my layman eyes, I can see how different the days are. But from your perspective, what, what's, you know, what, what, what's a heavy day look like and what's a, what's a light day? And, and, yeah. and, and the thinking behind it as well, perhaps. But. Yeah, I mean, I think we we work on something we call you know tactile periodization, where you're trying to you're trying to overload different parts of the game yeah. on different days. Um, yeah. And if you look at a lot of the, let's say, you know, we're we're all very influenced by you know different leagues and different coaches, and yeah. everyone now is you know uses the example of Pep Guardiola and Man City and what yeah. Man City's doing. And yeah. and if you look at the way they train, you know, they train, you know, based on this previously used in Barcelona, where everything yeah. is in a tight space and it's circulating the ball through tight spaces, which means it's a lot of hard accelerations, hard decelerations, yeah. a lot of short, tight sprints. Um, uh, and there's there's a huge benefit mm. to training like that, to training how we play through pressure and keep the ball. And you see you know, kind of the positional play that Josh is in favor yeah. of. You, you, you need that certain type of training yeah. for a certain volume over a certain part of the week. You know, however, uh, that's not the game fully because in the game you're making 40 yard sprints you're getting up and mm. back there's transition you've got 60 you know yards of space behind you so you need a day for that mm. as well so you do need a day where you you're working in bigger spaces more realistic to the game yeah um in particular in you know uh with spaces behind you um in transition so so there's a kind of two different mm. type of days that can both be heavy so when i say oh there's two heavy days per week then yeah normally it's one where you're really trying to play through little tight spaces and the other in these big spaces where transition becomes really important so. yeah maximizing players fitness and ability to perform is obviously the end goal but you're also trying to prevent yeah the, the, what everyone dreads in, in 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 the sport and that's injuries um are the two things the same thing or is it are you talking about two very different yeah. kind of mindsets. I there. think they're tied together. I, mean, I think yeah. they're tied together really closely in that, um, well, you're always going to have, let's say, contact you know, injuries where yeah. two players come into each other and it's a turned ankle and knee or you know, something like that. But, um, I mean, soft normally soft tissue injuries and you know, muscle injuries happen when you've overloaded something. Right. And sometimes it can be you've overloaded something in training or, or then it can also be a player hasn't fully recovered from the previous game. Yeah. And now he's done something in training or in a game, having not recovered from the previous game. Um, so so it's really important that we're kind of dosing what we're doing in training on a daily basis well. However, really tracking from game to game, how are players recovering, mm. how are they not recovering? And you've got uh, fatigue based on travel that you've, yeah. got, you've got to you know take into consideration, fatigue based on climate, which mm. obviously here is a – Big consideration. So, um, you know, we find that you know in, injuries tend to pop up when players. Well, not just we find that research says that you know injuries tend to pop up mm. in times when players are not fresh, they're not recovered. Yeah. Um, and so, being able to really track and and you know assess that is one of the key components of what yeah. you know the high performance department does. So. And, and clearly, we we've already seen the results of your work and your team's work this year because the Austin FC injuries. I'm not quite sure whether Austin fans are fully aware of just how special this this fact is, but our injury list has been close to non-existent this year. I mean, obviously we've had the- knock on wood there. Yes, yeah, well, yeah, well, let's, let's yeah, knock yeah, very yeah. firmly on wood. Uh, we, we, we've had the Johan Valencia- We don't always like to talk about uh, but, injury but, rates but no, I mean, yeah. but, it, but, it's, but it's, you know, you, you, your team has to take a lot of credit for that. And I'm sure, you know, even though it's a knock on wood yeah. situation, I'm sure it has to give you a lot of satisfaction seeing that thus far in the season, that's because it's such a massive factor in, in yeah. determining MLS success in this league, I think. And it's also, I mean, the, but it goes back to the collaboration as well, because yeah. again, if you look at research, I mean, research will say that coaches might be more responsible for injury rates than anyone else really? in terms of how they train, what they want to yeah. do. And, you know, and it's a, 
yeah. it's a credit to Josh and his staff where he really highly values our department and the right. work we do and making sure that we are working tightly with each other and um, and we have a really cohesive plan that we yeah. you know kind of put in place together to really make sure that the you know the players are, are fresh and and uh, and recovered yeah you know? and, and have the right balance I think of exercises and then and then at the end of the day players are going to have little knocks and tightness yeah. and, and symptoms and you know and and with our medical staff again is I think working at such a high level that mm. you know if we can identify someone early in the week you know the, the quality of treatment is so high that we can turn that play around by yeah. the, by the next game as well so. yeah and you know I'm sure you you won't disagree but to my mind it, it is it is a differentiating factor more in MLS than perhaps in any yeah, the big leagues, the teams that can stay healthy when when the narrow when the margins are so narrow yeah. between what teams can do on the field and any team can beat any other team. Like staying healthy is, yeah. is well, any yeah, any salary cap type league. I think right. you can only spend so much money throughout your squad, and if those players make a lot of money or are injured, yeah. you can't replace them. Right. Right. So, so one, you would like your best players to be healthy as often as possible. Um, I think two, from a tactical side having your best groups of players play lots of minutes together yeah. means they become more tactically cohesive as yes. a unit, which has huge advantages as you go through the season as well. So I think it's, it's, those are two big reasons why having the same group of players on the field week in, week out is super important. So full disclosure, we're taping this just a day before the, uh, the first big Dallas derby of the season, but it, but it also heralds the start of Perhaps the busiest stretch yeah. of the yeah. next uh, next next eighteen days, six games, six games in in three weeks. A uh, lot of lot of Wednesday, Saturday, some 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 weird kind of yeah. spacings between games. How does that affect what you and your team uh, do? It definitely uh, makes really assessing the recovery of all mm. the of all the players in between games is really really critical. Uh, I mean, our schedule this year is super funky, isn't it? Yes. You have Saturday, <laughs> you know. We'll, Got a we'll Tuesday have, night game coming yeah, up. Well, Monday night we have Saturday, you know, yeah. Saturday into Thursday, right? So yeah. at Charlotte Thursday, into Colorado on a Monday. July fourth, Monday, right? Yeah. And then and then you go then to. I think it's Saturday, Saturday. Tuesday, yeah. Saturday, Saturday, after that. Tuesday. So yeah. I mean, your normal midweek games are normally like a Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday. Um, right. And this is this is more odd, but I mean, actually. There's lots of four-day windows between those games, mm. you know, and I think there's a. It's a really significant difference if it's two, three, or four days right. between games, you know, and I think we yeah. our experience is that if you have a full four days between games, yeah. in normally everyone recovers fully yeah. between yeah. you know in that space of time. When you get to three games or three days, if you go you know Tuesday, Saturday, yeah. Wednesday, three recovery days you feel pretty good about that. Yeah. It's really when you just get like the two days going Wednesday, Saturday, yeah. or even last year we had the little, yeah. the little uh, stretch that was Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, which yeah. is almost unheard of, right? Yeah. So two days and in two days, you know, scientifically the players actually can't fully recover in just two days right. rest. So right. um, it doesn't mean they can't play, but it just means you're putting them on the field, not having fully recovered. So. Yeah. Three days is pretty good, and four days for sure. Everyone should be able to recover within four days. It's interesting because so when you see, you talked about Pep Guardiola and Man City, when you see the top European teams yeah. going, literally they've three three game weeks is almost the norm rather than yeah. the exceptions. Yeah. How 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 do they do? It? I mean, are they actually overstressing their yeah. their players by doing that? I mean, when you look at well, if you look at just the again optically, you look at the Liverpool's and Man City's. I mean, you know, Liverpool looked like at the end of the season they were. Yeah running on fumes yeah and it's i mean they're they are world-class athletes mm -hmm. obviously and and they're getting world-class treatment and massage and recovery and you know every technology under the sun uh and even with all that they still struggle to do that yeah. um and, and they do you know again they're they're fantastic athletes but uh i felt like looking at the premier league you could definitely see liverpool in particular just the Tail energy, the, the energy head. wasn't quite the energy that they thrive on wasn't quite you know at the highest level as the at the end of the year, which you can't blame them because they're playing upwards of sixty games yeah. a year. So. It's an astonishing amount of football, isn't it? Yeah. And then they go off and play for their countries too. Yeah. It's like and, and then travel look, is part yeah, of that yeah. as well. And England, I mean, if you just look at the English national team and some of those uh, international some of those games, in you June. could see that they just 
they didn't they were tired they didn't yeah. they didn't want to be there anymore and, yeah which is going to make the world cup interesting this year yeah. dave isn't it because it comes at a different time of year and yeah. in most players sort of it'll uh, be calendar. interesting because it'll be you know the players will have preseason now and and then they'll they'll be what th three months three four months into the yeah. season have a one week break and yeah and start up and uh in some ways it won't be at the end of a long season it'll mm. be midway through so that could actually help it but from yeah. a rhythm standpoint it's going to be a totally different rhythm from what they're they're used to yeah which be, uh, you you touched upon this brings me talking about world cup to the subject of climate you touched upon it and it's been a big part of kind of the interest around your work here is like how how do you exploit uh, our climate here in Austin and, and, and the heat specifically? Um, and how do you perhaps turn that into a, a home advantage for teams yeah. coming here who don't train in the heat? I mean, there's plenty in the league that do, but there's plenty also that come from yeah. a completely different climate. What, what, what's your thought on football and soccer being played in different climates? Because it was, you know, it was a sport that was invented in a very cool, yeah. wet climate. and. Yeah. Now it's played in very different climates and yeah. sort of challenges that brings. The challenge is really trying to maintain, you know, the, the tempo you want to play at, mm. knowing that, you know, the fatigue that comes from the heat and humidity will eventually yeah. have an effect. Um, so, you know, obviously we try to play a really high tempo pressing um, game at, at, you know, fairly fast speeds with lots of intensity. Um, and try to, and then by by nature try to make the opponent play like that yeah as well and take advantage of their inability to maintain that tempo um and that's <clears throat> on the one hand it's a challenge for us because mm. we are our guys are trying to sustain that that high intensity with with the climate um however we th the goal is to have teams come in that aren't used to playing in the seat and not yeah. be able to even keep up with us uh so Across the board, I think you know we we can do that, and I think we we we've seen that in a couple games so far. Um, but but it is a challenge because you know we're also training it over the course of the week as well. Yeah. So you know we yeah. train earlier. We have some stuff that we do with cooling strategies and things yeah. like that with the athletes that, that we think helps a lot. But um, you know I think long term it's going to be a, a big advantage. And I also think you know, adding in we're bringing players into this environment yeah. that you know, have not been around it. And you've talked to someone like Ruben Gabriel. Some Northern like, Europeans, you know, yes. <laughs> when we walked out in the, in, uh, at the, you know, afternoon game in Houston and Ruben looks at me at halftime, he's like, I've never felt this before. I have this, <laughs> I've never, I've never experienced this ever before. Right? No. So you have players that do come over from Europe to play in the uh, heat and humidity here. And it's yeah. totally new. And so playing against teams that have more of those players, you know, in this league will be an advantage for us. Mm. Um, but also, it, you know, recognizing that it takes our new players time to adapt as yeah. well. So. Yeah. How's the whole? Uh, we've talked a lot on various different shows and podcasts about that. Just, just the evolution from year one to year two in this club, and it's for you in your career. It's the second time you've been involved in yeah. uh, an expansion team. You were in there right from the from the word go with the Seattle Sounders. Um, and how's the year one? to year two evolution here being from your perspective we've seen clearly the results on the field and and the vast improvement um and you know you talk to some of the other members of the coaching staff and they they were like well no it's not just a jump this is this is this is a smooth progression yeah. that carried on through the off season as well and and just picked right up in february is that is that the way you've experienced it yeah yeah i mean i think it's um uh it feels really i would say it in some ways, it's similar to, uh, you know, the Seattle expansion, but in some yeah. ways, it's different because the league is different. Like it is yeah. a different league from two thousand nine, and the quality of the league, and and also, I probably even say more so, the expansion process, right? Mm. The expansion draft and acquiring players. It's a, it's it's just such Very a different, different yeah. a different place. Yeah. And, you know, the mechanisms for for acquiring new players and expansion. Um, make it a different team that makes it a different team to work with and yeah. prepare. Um, what I would say is that, yeah, I mean, I think we had, you know, a whole lot of guys came in. It was a kind of a mix of older MLS veterans mm. and then a lot of younger players. Mm. Um, I think our younger players did a great job just spending time with us in the off season. Mm. You're seeing like, you know, Danny Perrin, Owen Wolf, I think, 
in particular, two of the the guys you see that see the results. Are out I mean, they, yeah. you know, Danny was with us a lot in the off season. Obviously, Owen yeah was uh, not really going anywhere, so he was right. around with us a lot. So, in that case, just those you know the the young players who stayed around. John Kolmanich was in and out, and uh, you see that you see the evolution from year one mm. year one to year two with those guys, mm. right? And then I think then with the others, it's really you know adaptation to how Josh you know, wants to play and then yeah. with the climate and how we do things and how we train and you know across the board I think you've seen this really 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 positive uh, evolution mm. from year one to year two yeah you know and it's a mixture of physically preparing as well as you know tactically you know with the coaching staff uh, you know sharing the same language getting on the same page you know even yeah. better than we did in year one and you know it, it is a process but we, we've already seen the benefits of that yeah year one is is startup mode isn't yeah. it i mean really everyone kind of figuring out yeah their role in the grand scheme of things and and trying to you know. and then also having a whole group of players outside the league coming in yeah that have to figure out the league because it is not an easy league to play in right as well and i think that's sometimes underestimated um the quality league is is you know exponentially improving yeah. but then also uh the travel mm. the climate the different surfaces, you yeah. know, the size of the country makes it a really, really challenging league that no one really takes into account when they when they when they first come in. Yeah. How, uh, again, going back to your experience, you know, sort of spanning your your career as a high performance director and how you started off in in Seattle and and going through the expansion process. I want to ask you about working with two very different head coaches, at least on the yeah. on the outside, because Siggy Schmidt, of course, everyone loved. Siggy, so a beloved figure in the game, and it just seems to be a very different character and, yeah. and coach to working with a, a younger head coach like Josh starting in his professional career. Now, your field, I'm sure, has changed dramatically yeah. in that time too, but just, just I, I don't know how, how different the experience has been in, in that collaboration process with, with a head coach and two so different yeah. head coaches. Yeah. And that's where it comes in. I think the league is such a different place now and yeah um ziggy was a master in knowing the different pieces he needed to get in for yeah for how he wanted to play for his team and i think he was he was great about knowing okay what's the next piece of this team i need to help it continue to elevate and get better and um and and so he came in and you know looked at the group and figure out what pieces we needed and i think in that in that age it was a lot easier to get some yeah. of the, some of the pieces in and um and put together a really, really competitive team. And, you know, and I think kept things basic. You know, I think mm. tactically it was, you know, for the most part it was four two three one or four four two and it was, you know, fairly basic in how we played, but it was just, you know, continuing to add small pieces to the team and, and improve the quality and give the group confidence and um, and have the right leaders in. And his teams are always competitive, mm. you know. And then you kind of juxtapose that to you know to Josh, who you know has a has a clear tactical vision of how he wants. I mean, how we train, I think, is at a extremely high level mm. in terms of you know positional play and the different exercises we want to do with different you know different goals for each each exercise within each training session. Yep. Um, really trying to figure out what the opponent's doing weekly and you know how to counteract what they want to do tactically and then merge that with the physical and merge that with making sure we're keeping the group physically at a high level and getting what they need without overdoing any of that mm. and being able to marry all those things uh, together um, in a world where you can get high level players and, you know, and tactically do things that maybe you couldn't you know, yeah. a decade ago. So, yeah. Are you and your team involved, involved on the recruiting side? And, and you know, if, if 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 Austin are looking at potential players, um, it's it's hard, I'm sure, to evaluate yeah. a player's you know the major sort of fitness data points that you would like to have, or maybe that is available to you. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. No, it's, you... Yeah, the fitness data tends to be less available mm. um, outside the league, and obviously with, with within the league, we're getting yeah. you know tracking data on every player you know in the league every game. Mm. So within the league, we know where. Every player in the league is relative to our players and relative yeah. to each other, and we've got really good kind of benchmarks uh, from that standpoint. 
outside league is really hard. You know, there's a couple leagues where it's more available, but it's mm. uh, it's harder to get any physical data mm. outside. You know, this yeah. league. Uh, I mean, Hayden Van Brewers are is our data analyst. Yeah. Um, who is in within my department as well that works with you know Claudio and Sean Rubio. Yeah. You know, on yep. on the recruitment side with data there, um, but outside of Hayden, you know, not as much outside the league. We probably have less. I mean, a, a lot of it, you know, the the biggest predictor of injury is mm. previous injury, right? Yes. So as we go sign a player, you know, we definitely do our due diligence in looking into mm. what that player may have had in the past, and uh, you still never fully know a player till he comes on mm. site. But um, we really, obviously, try to dig in about you know what that player's had in the past and 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 how many games he plays has played a year and um you know it, ten, there, it tends to be very trend based yeah. right a player that's played 35 games a year will typically yeah. be able to continue to play 35 yeah. games a year so so yeah it it it, it, it the, the data points that you use and how you judge a player's fitness is of interest to me because you look at someone like Diego Fagundes. You, yeah. you talk about a player with a lot of mileage. I mean, he's been playing, you know, thirty games a year yeah. as a professional since he was seventeen. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, he's gonna at this pace, he's gonna play play five hundred games in in his MLS career. Uh, and you know, he looks like a player that could just run and run and uh, you know until midnight every yeah. every night if required. Um, I don't know if you judge him the same way that. Sort of fans and and the laypers and commentators. It's easy for us to say, "Oh, he can run all night." Maybe you are looking at Diego differently and seeing all sorts of stresses and, and no, loads no, on yeah. him. No, he does. He's. I mean, he covers a lot of ground. He's got yeah. you know really good outputs. Um, and we're lucky, I think. You know, and, and I think the way we want to play. I mean, Diego has great outputs in terms of we look at total distance and high mm. speed running and sprint distance and things like that. And and I would say, you know. Diego is, you know, good to very good in, yeah. in, in all those. And you've got someone like Maxi Aruti as well. I mean, Maxi Aruti is, you know, in top five for mm. strikers in terms of distance yeah. covered and high speed yeah. running. And, you know, uh, Owen Wolf actually is absolutely th through the roof on mm. those metrics as well. And so, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and uh, Seba as Drusi well. Drusi's a hard yeah. worker, yeah. isn't he? So, so when you have a front four, right, that can – run has the mm -hmm. willingness and ability to run like that then again tactically there's so much you can do and how you want to press opponents and, and yeah and play so um definitely look at all those things and and it's hard to cover a lot of distance mm. and sprint a lot at the same time mm. and you then there's always kind of this balance and interplay um you know you have in Seattle, they had a player like Nico Ladero that would cover 13 kilometers a game, yeah. and you know, and and decent high speed running, but you know, probably was not an, an out and out sprinter. But what he gave you with those 13,000 mm. meters were such you know high quality and so useful for the team. So it's always if if you have a little bit more in one of those areas, you're probably going to be a little bit less somewhere else. Yeah, um, you have pure pure sprinter types that can have these huge sprint outputs, and those players tend to not cover as much total distance. So there's kind of relationship, you know, between working in those all different work domains. Mm. Um, Diego happens to be one who's fairly balanced, right? He gives you a lot of total yeah. distance. He gives you a good amount of high speed running. Yeah. He gives you a decent amount of sprint distance as well. So, you know, that's kind of how we're looking at all, yeah. of, our, all, all of our guys. Are there different um, fitness concerns, performance data points you're looking at in different positions? Like, do, do you treat defenders a little differently to yeah i mean central defenders tend to be a little bit different from yeah. the rest of them right because they're these yeah these big guys <laughs> that you know don't cover a ton of distance right but, but but when they have to be fast they have to be fast right they have yeah. to be able to sprint um you know but they tend to be your your taller bigger heavier guys mm. that you know and also they're very a lot of their running is more reactive as right it, right they're not right. being proactive and pressing they're yeah. they're having to sprint because you know the Something's other team happened. plays through you or yeah. you know they they the other teams play the ball over the top or whatever it is um so uh in the moments when those players have to be able to run and be fast they still mm. have to do that and we'll track that but yeah we wouldn't look at let's say a central defender's high speed running and judge yeah. his athletic abilities by right that. but then when you also factor in where they are in their career dave how, how different might 
someone like Kip Keller and yeah. Ruben Gabrielson, two players who play the same position. There are very different points in their careers. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So are they? You know, are you looking at different things with those two players, even though they no, they I mean, play the same position? When it comes to central defense, probably not as much, right? Because mm. there will be certain moments where in the same situations they both have to be fast, yeah. right? And so... Yeah. Um, that's different than a yeah yeah or maybe an Owen Wolf and an Ethan Findlay maybe that yeah. maybe that combination someone who's seventeen someone who's thirty one they're playing essentially the same position yeah um, just wondering how how different their sort of how you judge their yeah their fitness I and think their it's data totally points. different it really depends on yeah again tactically if if a player t you know I think you know let's say Hector Jimenez is a good example because mm. Hector is such a smart player or mm. sometimes. He doesn't have to run as much because of how he's reading the play. Yeah. Right. And so you might have a a 18, 19 year old, you know, right back that runs up and down the field and is not quite as effective. And Hector might run at high intensities half as much as that and get more done mm. because he's reading the play so well. He's not out of position. He's not chasing. Yeah. He knows how to cut out certain passing angles. And so by the nature of reading everything like that, okay, he actually doesn't, ha he doesn't. He's maybe not able to run as much as the eighteen year old, but he doesn't have to anymore yeah. because of how he's reading it. And there those are the really intelligent players. I think right. you can make up for, you know, a loss of athleticism over the course of your career by being yeah. so smart. Yeah. Uh, Hector is one of those guys who is that smart. Uh, but uh but you'd have to be pretty smart to have to run less because you yeah. read everything so fast. So there are still some things about this game that aren't quantifiable you, you can't you can't put a number to yeah. number to it like that like you, you yeah. soccer savviness how yeah, do you, how yeah, do you yeah. and there's i mean there's there's the technical and there's the tactical and there's the you know right you can bump a guy or um step in the right passing lane and yeah you can't it's hard to quantify those things right yeah yeah um how how uh how do you see this we talked some about some of your journey to this point and you were yeah. in right at the start of this field at high in fact your your job title changed i think two or three different yeah, times when, you, yeah. when yeah. you were Seattle, eventually yeah. becoming high performance director and then i know you stepped away for a little bit and went to the nba and i'd love to hear hear, hear um what you took from your time with the orlando magic that you may been able to bring back to soccer but but I'm interested in where you think this field is going. Where, where's, where's now? Where, where, where do you see it? Given where it's come in the last ten years, what, what might your role be in, yeah. in another ten years? Do you yeah. think? Well, I think you know, and again, looking at my NBA experience, um, these staffs are just getting bigger. Yeah, right. And they're so becoming think, more specialized. Is yeah, that what it is? Yeah, there's more specialized, but also I think there's more. There's more attention taken on let's say the, in a lot of ways on the medical side, right? So, yeah. so the number of therapists and trainers that look after the athletes, like that's, that's increasing. Yeah. Um, they're better taken care of. There's a specialization around sports science and, you know, performance coaching. That's definitely more specialized. Mm. And, and so, especially within my role in the role of high performance director, um, again, it is about how you are managing this group to be mm. this really, you know, interdisciplinary yeah. team that uh complements each other's skill sets yeah. i think you know and so my opinion is that staffs are only going to get bigger more specialized probably and i think and i think they'll continue to uh evolve like i i personally think there's going to be roles that develop down the road that don't exist right now mm. just as if yeah. again 10 years ago this my role now did not exist yeah Right, and that yeah. is going to continue to happen um, out of necessity. Mm. Right? I think we we live in this really siloed world in the past, where you had you how know, here's your 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 you know your coach and your goalkeeper coach mm. and your strength coach and your athletic trainer and yeah. you know and and they're all their own yep. silos and that's I think we're beyond we're beyond that now, right? Where you right. have yeah. athletic trainers and physical therapists and sports scientists and performance coaches and you know and, and now you have even like on the coaching side you have set play coaches yeah and, you know, throwing uh, coaches yeah, are yeah. coming up yeah. exactly throwing coaches and and so um there will be you know continue to evolve these roles that have never existed um and then how does you know someone yeah. like the high performance director actually make that group work together yeah. to continue to yeah make good decisions yeah um so what did, what did, what was the main thing you took away from 
your three years in the NBA. And also, I, I know you had an, an opportunity at one point to actually go to the NFL and and turn that down. Yeah. Um, do you think do you think soccer can still learn things from from other sports and and oh, yeah. you know, some of the yeah. differences involved? And, yeah. Um, I think again, I mean, what we just talked about uh, in yeah. the NBA was the level of. Well, I guess what I would say is my role in the NBA was was really really different, and that mm. um, these high price athletes, uh, you end up almost creating what I would use the term like these ecosystems around each right. individual athlete, right? Yeah. And so you have yeah. fifteen players, you have a head coach, you have five assistant coaches, and each assistant coach has three players they're assigned to for the whole year. Yeah. You might have three, four physical therapists, medical staff that treat these athletes daily. Mm. You might have two strength coaches. Uh, a sports scientist might also be a strength coach. A dietitian, sports psychologist, like all these different roles. And essentially, you know, my role in the NBA was really to try to figure out for each one of these athletes, what was the right therapist for that mm -hmm. person? What was the right strength coach? The head coach would assign an assistant yeah. coach Maybe they have they need more of a sports psych, psych with them. Maybe they need yeah. more of a, a dietitian with them. Yeah. And so what three to four staff members had to be placed around each one of these athletes to get them what they needed on a daily yeah. basis. Um, and it was the level of indi individualization was, uh, you know, a level I had not seen mm. before. Mm. Um, and even you know, but again, you say that. The tenth, eleventh guy in NBA roster yeah. is still making two, three, four million dollars a year, and so you know they're demanding that level of individual care yeah. as well. Um, and so, um, and then, and then also from the standpoint of the agents, right? Because you're seeing high level soccer across mm -hmm. the world had the you know, the importance of agents, yeah, right. And and it's the same and NBA, NFL, and so a lot of my role was also speaking with the agents and making sure the agents are on board from their side because right. sometimes the agent can be really impactful to the athlete. So yeah. Um, if you, let's say, for an example, you're doing something with an athlete with a dietitian that might involve blood work, and then you're mm. involving the agent to make sure they're on board getting the blood work, right. and uh, and then that that agent becomes part of that ecosystem you're managing as well. And so, ah. it's, uh, so do you think that level of individualized care, the top level athletes, does already exist in soccer and at the you know the highest levels of I think it's on European its way there. I think there's probably a level of. Uh, resistance a little bit mm. because there is this there can easily be the sentiment that that's taking away from the team side right 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 and i think that's the fear yeah. and people don't want to yeah give in to that right yeah. so you still have like you know these you know the agents and some yeah. of the third party practitioners that want to deal with the athletes they're kind of they're still being kind of held away at you know yeah. arm's length by clubs in europe um and that's you know something that's the it's one of the reasons why I think the NBA has really exploded in terms of the amount of physical therapists mm. that work with all these teams because all these athletes need so much medical care and yeah. and the reality is like if you with with an athlete of any sport making millions of dollars a year if the club does not provide that for them then they go get it somewhere else yeah and now you lose yeah. a little bit of connection with that athlete so that's going to happen I think and you know when you watch kind of the uh, you know the Amazon Prime shows of Tottenham <laughs> or any of that, and, and yeah. the players go to get treatment and you've got, you know, eight, nine massage therapists yeah. across. The, that's one of the reasons why that's happened in, uh, you know, in, in yeah. Premier League soccer, that the money's there, the players are, are, are highly compensated. They demand a certain amount right. of attention. They're going to get that attention, whether it's the whether the club provides it for them or someone else. Right. So you're better off the club providing it. Um, but then someone has to manage that whole process yeah. to make sure that it's all going in the right direction. It's interesting you mentioned the team dynamic being the, the crucial difference. Uh, yeah. You know, the NBA with the superstars and the sort of individual nature of the game yeah. being, being more tailored to that. And maybe some of that in the NFL and, with Tom Brady yeah. doing his own yeah. fitness stuff. You know? Yeah. But, and it's squad size too. I mean, with the NBA yeah. with 15 is different than uh, right. you know, most soccer teams with, with 30. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Dave was was a player as well, which is which is great because I, I love it when players sort of move on and become, you know, you know follow yeah. follow a career path. You you were a goalkeeper. Um, I tried. And, <laughs> I tried to be enough. I was, but and goalkeepers have a very different tried, sort of yeah. uh, set of fitness yeah. parameters as well, don't they? I yeah. mean, I know our three goalkeepers strike me as being really fit. I don't know if they would 
would they lose a race if the whole squad had a uh, had a they might win a short race but after about five <laughs> yards they, uh, they're at a disadvantage <laughs> how was your uh how was your playing career when you look back on it? Because I know you played collegiately and you played professionally. Um, we were talking about this off air the other day in the uh, in the old yeah, yeah. NPSL. Yeah, um, I mean, I I played at Virginia Tech and played three years yeah. and really wanted to try to go play in Germany and try to have a career and you know had two years in the lower divisions of Germany yeah. and didn't quite make it and came back and played indoor soccer for seven years and and I'll be frank, like I was not going very far you know in a professional career and i uh at that point really got into coaching right and really enjoyed coaching and i think as i was leaving the, my playing career indoors in the baltimore blast um i uh i thought i was just going to be a youth coach be yeah. uh you know I, I i had left to be a director of coaching for a club in virginia wanted to start getting in like the academy coaching side yeah. and um didn't actually at that point conceptualize I'd be doing what I was today and yeah. went back to school, finished a degree in coaching science from George Mason. And uh, and then actually, you know, the, the turning point was I, at that point, as I wanted to be a coach, a high level coach, went to the Czech Republic and did the A license mm. in the Czech Republic and lived in Prague. And, and it was super scientific, you yeah. know, the, kind of the Czech, you know, the kind of that Eastern yeah. European methodology you know it was yeah. very very scientific and that just seemed to click and connect with me and uh you know they would talk about the stuff i talk about now yeah. with josh the periodization models yeah. and you know how you load different you know different physical parameters of the course of the week and and that just really clicked and so i just came back and specialized in the in the physical side yeah. and and you know moved more away from the youth coaching and it was a year or so after that is when uh, i went with uh Cardinal for to Kansas City. Yeah, I, I and on that fact, on that point, you you already mentioned this. Um, you had an early encounter with with Josh Wolf and Davey Arno yeah, at yeah. Kansas City as as yeah. uh, Davey was there in two thousand seven. Yeah, as their strength and conditioning yeah. coach. Yeah, yeah. and then two thousand eight. I mean, two thousand eight. You know, Chris Henderson left our coaching staff and went to Seattle. Yeah, and so it was really just like I said before, it went just the three of us in in Kansas City. So I was. I think the 2008 year I was a fitness coach and goalkeeper coach and assistant coach for, for the team. And, um, Many hats. How, yeah. were the, how were those guys as, as players? Uh, <laughs> were, they, were they a pain? No, well, <laughs> Davey climbed on the referees as much as yeah. uh, the, the, the worst of them, but, uh, but a competitor. I mean, Davey yeah. was a competitor every single day and every single practice. And, you know, and then Josh and I got close because he had um, signed back by KC – from 1860 yes, Munich that's right. in that summer. Too. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, I worked with him in that summer uh, on a fitness program to get him back up and running. He had some injuries at Munich and, you know, uh, came back and needed kind of a full preseason in July and, yeah. we, you know, had to build him back up. And you know, we needed him because we were trying to make a playoff run that year. And um, so the two of us spent a lot of time, you know, on the training field just trying to get him fit um, and ready. Uh, and he was, I mean, you could just see then, I think, some of it, you know, the intelligence of how he saw mm. attacking play and, mm. you know, making runs in the box and the different things he was thinking of in terms of run, you know, running in the box that I just never thought of before. And so it was pretty clear, I think, then that he had a a unique vision, you know, yeah. kind of of the game, and especially yeah. on the attacking side. It, it's so interesting because from the outside looking in, you can, you're can you never quite sure what players are going to go on yeah. to become coaches. And, uh, yeah. I, I called many of Josh's games right from right from the word go when he was a rookie with the fire and just didn't know that that was that yeah. was in his in his destiny and yeah. uh, you know obviously something he set his stall out to do from, yeah. from, from and there was obviously age. I developed a relationship with him there and then he went but you know went to DC and then he was on the coaching staff at DC and we would play each other we'd you know sit down for yeah. lunch and you know trade notes and then uh, you know then he went on to Columbus and we kind of did the same from there so I kept in the you know, pretty I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, uh, weekly, but, you know, let's say yeah. you know, it's one of those things every three to four months we would chat, you know, over the course of that time. Strikes me we've got a few, few of the uh, more veteran players on this squad who may yeah. go on to yeah. become coaches, players that see the game. Yeah. Like yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, Hector, obviously, Hector Jimenez. Yeah, Ethan Finley, Felipe. Yeah, yeah. I, I think those are the exact those names three I was in, thinking in particular. About. You definitely can see them being a coach down the road, and yeah, um, and they love the game. You know, I think yeah. that's that's you know, that's what comes out right away. 
Yeah. Um, one one just uh, previous quote of you is just to, to finish up. I, I yeah. feel like I could talk all afternoon, but I know got to let you go. We got a busy got a busy uh, yeah. period coming up. But um, our our producer, give him a big shout out as well, Spencer uh, Smallwood. Listen Spencer to, is amazing. He Spenny is uh, Spenny in the Jets. We okay. call him. Um, but he he dug into a previous podcast you've done. I'm not sure which one it was, and, and there's a quote that, which is amazing. I just want to get your okay. follow up thought on it. Um, you said one little change to uh, an ecosystem or dynamic of an organization can have a massive ripple effect downstream that might not be recognized until it's too late, sort of like the, the classic butterfly effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just wanted you to expand on that thought, really, because obviously a team is, a, is, a, is an interesting or, yeah. organism, isn't it? And, and, yeah. and little things can have big effects further yeah. down the road. Is there any, any, any sort of... Oh yeah, Spencer, Any sort of Spencer examples? knows I'm a big fan of complex <laughs> systems. And, uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I recently just finished my uh, PhD, you know, in organizational oh, leadership wow. and development. Fantastic! And Did you do that here in Austin, or it was an online program? Okay, you know, so it was the University of Arizona, so I finished yeah. it, and, and and a lot of it was, I think, looking at, um, you know, organizations as complex systems. We have the yeah. interaction of all these different departments and how different decisions. Again, they have these mm. downstream impacts that I think people don't don't think of yeah um positive and negative yeah yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so and again i think it's um even something as basic as like you know let's say this year we've hired uh, hillary Cawthon as our sports psychologist yeah yeah and and from an ecosystem standpoint she has radically changed mm. in a positive way you know the way that we communicate our culture you know things like that and, and well i wouldn't say that's a small thing like mm. it's a it's a you know Significant. It's a, a significant hire from yeah. our side, um, but but just adding someone like her and the staff, you know, as a as a part time mm. member because she's also split. She's with the San Antonio Spurs as well, and mm. has some other uh, collegiate groups she works with. Um, but the addition of her as the right person for that role just has these you know profound effects, yeah, organizationally um, that that will change. I think will change the organization for yeah. the better you know, forever. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, I think it's just, it's additions and subtractions from your group have such lasting rippling effects, yeah. which is really this you know, concept of, of yeah. complex systems. And really, really interesting stuff. Uh, and congratulations, by the way. Does this oh, mean we have to call you Dr. Dr. Uh, Tenny I now? I prefer not. I prefer <laughs> not. No, no, no. That's, that's amazing though. I know how much work that, that must've been. Uh, and that's, that's after, you're nine to five as well, doing doing yeah. doing a PhD. Yeah. I'm lucky so. I have a, a patient uh, family, <laughs> a wife and kids. Do you, so. do, and, and last last thing, do you, do you enjoy life in Austin? Do you, your family enjoy being here. I know you've lived many different places. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's a fantastic city, and you know, and obviously the the support. I mean, it's funny where our, where some of the similarities I think of of Austin and Seattle. I remember walking out, played New York Red Bull in the opening yes opening game for remember it well, know, Freddie yeah. Montero, yeah. yeah. And I remember walking out and seeing the crowd and, you know, in that time in CenturyLink and looking around and thinking like, wow, I didn't think that the U.S. could, <laughs> could actually provide this atmosphere, yeah. right? And yeah. really special. And, you know, and then you walk out, you know, in the opening game here at Q2 Stadium and see the crowd and the culture and just, again, like this, this super cool yeah. mix of, you know, of people in the crowd and, and the atmosphere they're able to create and thinking, I thought the same thing, like, wow, I actually didn't think... It could feel like this in this country um so it's uh yeah it's the way they've embraced it the way the, the yeah. public has embraced it has been amazing um city is is great it's obviously different climate although having said that i was in orlando which yeah. is pretty warm and humid but this is yeah. uh you know this is it's, it's been hot this summer uh but it's a you know it's a great city and you know and also i think just the nature of the of the people and again we've got a uh, you know, a tech savvy mm. community in Austin mm. as well, which, which I think ends up, you know, you have a community around you of people that also have interest in, yeah. you know, in some of the tech that we're always being yeah. contacted by. And, um, you know, it's a, again, it's a, I don't want to overuse the phrase, a, a cool ecosystem, but you know, the <laughs> ecosystem that's developed here has been, uh, unique and fun and i'm so. sure you see i mean i see it all the time. Where, wherever you go in the city it can be something as mundane as getting your hair cut there's always someone if you're wearing yeah. anything yeah. Austin wise, it's always someone who yeah 
sparked oh, up a conversation. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. excitement of you know being the first major league sports team in the city is just, it's, uh, I mean, it's again something we'll we'll yeah. we'll always have, yeah. right? And that's something yeah. Ziggy used to always talk about. He's like, always be the first and yeah. something you know, do things that people can never take away from you. And clearly, being here in this space is, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll always remember that. Well, we are lucky to have you, Dr. Tenney. Very lucky indeed. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so glad you're... actually you're... the first person to actually ever call me. That's uh, my <laughs> privilege. To... Hey, I man managed to get <laughs> A-firsted today. Yeah. No, terrific stuff. And thank and, and, thank and, and thanks for all the uh, the great work your team are doing with uh, with the team. And the, and the results are self-evident. Yeah, and we just so. hopefully we keep it going. It's a long hey, season. And, it is uh, a long season. And the but... games are coming. We'll be coming hard and fast. But we're super happy with where we are right now. Great stuff. Okay. Dave Tenney, everyone, that high performance director of Austin FC. Thank you so much for being with us again on Verde and Black. And I will talk to you next time. See thank you then. You.